English has risen to become the dominant world language. Because most Christianized nations use English as their chief means of communication, for English-speaking believers, it is crucial to understand the history of our language accurately ourselves before presenting vaguely constructed etymologies, particularly when expanding the words of the Bible. Many cults, which prefer old wives' tales over the Word of God, despise the very word Easter, believing it to be a Christianized pagan festival of the spring goddess Ishtar. Many good Christians also feel obligated to their conscience to reject celebrating Easter because they too believe it to be based on idolatry and paganism. The traditions which have been added to Easter have not helped either. Most English speaking people associate chocolate eggs and rabbits with Easter as much as they do the celebration of Christ's resurrection. Hebrew Pesach became Greek Pascha. In most languages, the word for Easter is exactly the same as the word for Passover. So the relationship between the Feast of Passover and the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ is directly linked. All these words mean both Easter and Passover. Only the context formulates the difference. With the exception of English and German, all other European languages do not have separate words for Easter and Passover, but simply use a single term derived from Pesach, the Hebrew word for Passover. In one way this is an advantage to the believer, who immediately associates Jesus Christ as the Passover lamb, whether reading the New or Old Testaments. The association between Christ and the Passover is clearly seen. This was also the case in the original Greek language, which uses the Greek Pascha for both Passover and the resurrection of Christ. This has been the same for 2000 years in the Greek. Even if you look up a modern Greek dictionary, it will tell you that Pascha means both Easter and Passover. This was also the case in English until Tyndale coined the term Passover. But as we shall see, the English rendition of Easter and Passover in the King James Bible is superior and needs to be exalted into its rightful place in English Bible versions, dictionaries and Christian literature again. This does not conclude that the English is superior to the original Greek, which is a form of Rachmanism. But in this particular instance, there is a special feature in the King James Version, which is made clear in the original Greek when read in context, but is made abundantly clear by the scholarship of the King James Version translators in English. Just as most Bibles include things like capitalization of deity or have the words of Christ in red and other helps, so too do the King James Version translators make the Old Testament Passover and New Testament Easter easier for the reader to understand in context. When the Bible was being translated into the Latin language in the 4th century, when translating the word Pascha, which can mean both Passover and Easter in Latin, Jerome simply used the same Greek word without creating a new Latin word in its place. Thus Pascha was basically untranslated. In the first translation of the entire Bible into English, the handwritten Wycliffe Bible in 1382 appears basically the same untranslated Latin word Pascha. When we come to the Latin word Pascha, it is transliterated without an English equivalent. The words used were Pasch and Pasche, still a basic type of the Hebrew word Pesach and Greek Pascha. Later, when Roman Catholic scholars translated the Douay Reims Bible from the same Latin Vulgate in the 17th century, they used the word Pasche, which gave it a more English feel, but was still, in essence, untranslated. Wycliffe version translates Acts chapter 12 verse 4, and when he had caught Peter, he sent him into prison, and betook four quaternions of knights to keep him, and would after Pasch bring him forth to the people. So we can see the English language in the 1300s had the same characteristics as most foreign languages do today concerning the translation of Pascha as meaning both Easter and Passover. Then Tyndale gave us a greater advantage by using the word Easter in his translation and then later inventing the term Passover. Ultimately, this gave us two separate words for two distinct occasions. It must be noted that the Anglo-Saxon term Easter 
was used much more frequently in common literature to denote the Passover and the celebration of the resurrection than the Latin Pasch ever was. Pasch was basically a synonym for Easter, meaning both Passover and Easter, but was mainly used by the clergy. So as we can see, the word Easter in Anglo-Saxon was used for both the Jewish Passover and the celebration of the resurrection, and also was very commonly used. William Tyndale was a brilliant scholar and was first to incorporate Easter in an English Bible. He also invented the word Passover. William Tyndale translated and printed the New Testament in English and the first five books of the Old Testament between 1525 and 1535 in Germany and the Low Countries while in exile. He was the first person to ever print an English translation. He worked from the original Greek and Hebrew texts at a time when knowledge of those languages in England was rare. He was educated at Oxford University and later at Cambridge where he also lectured and became skilled in not only Hebrew and Greek but also Latin, Italian, Spanish and French with such fluency that Hermann Bushius, a friend of Erasmus, stated Whichever he spoke to you, you would suppose it his native tongue. Tyndale was responsible for the insertion of both Easter and Passover in the English Bible. In his 1525 New Testament, Tyndale used the English word Easter to translate the Greek word Pascha. Pascha, being formally transliterated in Wycliffe's version, was for the first time in a Bible translation translated into a unique English word. As we can conclude from the Anglo-Saxon terms mentioned above, English people celebrated the season around the Jewish Passover as Easter. Also, it must be pointed out that Tyndale used Easter as a synonym, expressing the Jewish Passover and never in association with a pagan festival. Some modern day scholars conclude that the word Easter has pagan origins, but the facts are that the word Easter and also the celebration of Easter are entirely Christian. Easter was not only a synonym for Passover, but also a descriptive word revealing the New Testament fulfillment of the Passover in Christ's death, burial and resurrection. The Greek word Pascha occurs 29 times in the New Testament and Tyndale has Easter 14 times, Easter lamb 11 times, Easter fest once, and Paschal Lamb three times. In 1525, Tyndale's New Testament was printed. Five years later, in 1530, he printed the first five books of the Old Testament. When Tyndale was working on the New Testament, the word Easter was adequate to translate Pascha. But when he started the Old Testament book of Exodus, in chapter 12, verse 11, he discovered that the word Easter, which means a resurrection, was inappropriate. This problem involved the translating of the Hebrew word Pesach, which if translated Easter, meaning resurrection, would form an anachronism, which from the Greek ana means against and chronos meaning time, which is something located at a time which it could not have existed or occurred. Basically, if you use the English word Easter, which describes Christ's resurrection in the translation of the Old Testament, he would be speaking of an event that had not yet happened. The Easter lamb or resurrection lamb was a logical translation to Tyndale in the New Testament setting, but seemed rather odd in the Old Testament. So Tyndale, with his astounding linguistic ability, formed the word Passover and used it in all 22 places in the Old Testament. The word Passover comes from the idea that God passed over the houses of the Israelites who had marked their doorposts with the blood in obedience to God. And the children of Israel were spared when... God smote the firstborn sons of the Egyptian taskmasters on the eve of the Exodus. The sons of Israel were thus redeemed from the land of sin, Egypt, and redeemed from Pharaoh to serve Jehovah. The Hebrew word Pesach was understood by the Israelites at the time to mean to skip over or to limp. So Tyndale used two words, pass and over, meaning to skip over or to limp over, which shortly became the one word, Passover, in the 1530 Pentateuch, but Easter remained in Tyndale's revision of a New Testament in 1534. Brilliantly, Tyndale's Passover also incorporates the pass sound found in Pasch and Pascha. Interestingly, the word passion, which means suffering, 
seems to have evolved from Pasca. Perhaps Gibson should have called his film The Pasca of the Christ. Since the time of the King James Version until the early 20th century, the term Easter was commonly identified by believers solely as a celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Before Tyndale, Easter was the chief word used for the Jewish Passover by Christians. This is because Easter and Passover were the same season, Jews celebrating the shadow and Christians celebrating the fulfillment. The word Easter has illustrated to the Englishman much more than simply the Passover celebration, but through Tyndale's edition of Easter, construction of the word Passover, and later with the King James translators correctly reapplying Easter only once in Acts chapter 12 verse 4, it gives significant insight into the revealing of the fulfillment of the Passover in Christ. It exalts Jesus Christ's death and resurrection above all. In past times, Easter to the English speaker not only saw Christ as the Passover lamb, but clearly defined the difference in the celebrations, one containing the promise and one fulfilling the promise. Modern criticism has blurred this revelation. After 1611, the Old Testament Easter, which formerly meant both Passover and Easter, became solely the Old Covenant Passover, a trend Tyndale had begun to accomplish. Because Luther's version was printed before Tyndale's, Tyndale would have had the advantage of being able to cross-reference and improve any inconsistencies. Luther's translation was a strong influence on Tyndale's New Testament. Because of persecution in Catholic England, Tyndale left England for Germany. It is strongly believed that he met with Luther in Germany in 1525, as many of Tyndale's beliefs are, in essence, Lutheran. By the end of the year, Tyndale had printed the New Testament in English. It is likely that Tyndale's use of Easter in his New Testament is also indebted to his knowledge of Luther's German translation, which uses Uster, in the same way that Tyndale used Easter. Because the English Anglo-Saxon language originally derived from the Germanic, when the Angles, Saxons and Jutes came from England in the 5th and 6th centuries, there are many similarities between German and English. Many English writers have referred to the German language as the mother tongue. The English word Easter is of German-Saxon origin and not Babylonian, as Alexander Hislop falsely claimed, and as we shall see later. The German equivalent is Uster. Uster, Ustern being the modern day correspondent, is related to Ust, which means the rising of the sun, or simply in English, East. Uster comes from the old Teutonic form of Uferstehen, Uferstehang, which means resurrection, which in the older Teutonic form comes from two words, Erster, meaning first, and Stehen, meaning to stand. These two words combine to form Erstehen, which is an old German form of Erfurstehen, the modern day word for resurrection. The English Easter and German Uster go hand in hand. Tyndale, with his experience in the German language, knew of the Easter Uster association. Luther obviously defined Uster as both a synonym for the Jewish Passover and a phrase for the resurrection of Christ. In Luther's German New Testament, we find Ustern, Usterlam, Usterfest, Fest, and only once Das Passa in Hebrews 11.28. In his Old Testament, he used the German word Passeoffer, an obvious forerunner of Tyndale's Passover. Usterfest, Ustern, and Usterlam, once each. In Exodus chapter 12 verse 11, Luther rendered Passa, with a marginal note referring to the Usterlam. Even in contemporary German, the phrase das Jewish Usterfest, the Jewish Passover, demonstrates that the German Uster can mean both the Jewish and Christian festivals. In fact, the meaning of the German word Ustern is today just as the English word Easter was until the King James Version translators skillfully put it in its correct semantic range in Acts chapter 12 verse 4 thus separating forever the old Easter and the new Easter as we shall see.
Before the 1530s, England always used the word Easter for both the Jewish Passover and the Resurrection celebration. Sometimes clergy used the Latin Pasch or Pasche, but predominantly Easter. Here are two non-biblical examples of Easter and Passover being synonyms. We see Pasches appearing in the Petersburg Chronicle in 1122. A 1563 homilist spoke of Easter, a great and solemn feast among the Jews. Today, Pascha vaguely remains an adjective meaning Easter, as in Paschal Candle. In Scotland and North England, children hunt for Pasch eggs. In the 1537 Matthews Bible, which incorporated Tyndale's work on the Pentateuch, the word used was Passover, but there were references to Easter in the chapter summaries in Leviticus 23, Numbers 9 and Deuteronomy 16. In the 1539 Great Bible, they use Passover 14 times, while Easter appear 15 times, all in the New Testament. Acts chapter 12 verse 4 reads, And when they had caught him, they put him in prison also, and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to be kept, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. In the 1557 version of the Geneva Bible, Every place had Passover except Acts chapter 12 verse 4, where it had Easter, which was identical to how the King James Version translators eventually translated it. In the 1560 version of the Geneva Bible, which became the most popular of all the Geneva Bibles, the word Easter was completely substituted with Passover on all occasions. The Geneva Bible of 1560 does not use Easter anywhere. Acts chapter 12 verse 4 reads, And when he had caught him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to be kept, intending after the Passover to bring him forth to the people. In the 1568 Bishop's Bible, Easter appears twice in John chapter 11 verses 55 and Acts chapter 12 verse 4. The Bishop's Bible of 1568 translates Acts chapter 12 verse 4 this way, And when he had caught him, he put him in prison also, and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to be kept, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. In the 1611 authorised version, Easter appears once in Acts chapter 12, verse 4. The King James Bible finalised 86 years of change in the use of Easter and Passover. After seeing what Tinder had begun, and the refining of the word Easter within almost a century of various translation attempts, the King James Version translators caused the semantic range of Easter to be translated only once as Easter, in Acts chapter 12 verse 4. This was because in every instance in the New Testament except Acts chapter 12 verse 4, the Greek Pascha represented the pre-resurrection Passover, that is, the Jewish celebration, in other words, Christ had not yet died as the Passover lamb for the whole world. In Acts chapter 12 verse 4, it is a post-resurrection Passover where Christ had died and was risen. The Greek word Pascha appears 29 times in the New Testament. Of 28 of those instances, it is referring to the Old Testament Passover. But in Acts chapter 12 verse 4, it is referring to the New Testament celebration, which was the Lord's Supper. Christ had become the Lamb of God and replaced the old Passover sacrifice with a new covenant in his blood. Therefore, the old Passover type was replaced with the celebration of the death and resurrection of Christ, which is the fulfillment called Easter, meaning resurrection. Because the King James translators rendered this one word in Acts chapter 12 verse 4, with the understanding that it was the Christian resurrection celebration being celebrated and not just the old Passover, it stands to be the most accurate of all English translations concerning this topic. After 1611, with the predominance of the King James Version and with the process of time, Passover became known as an Old Testament word and Easter became known as a New Testament word. The only other time Pascha is mentioned in a post-resurrection semantic range is in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 7 for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us Tyndale's Bible has for Christ our Easter lamb is offered up for us 
Obviously with the semantic range of the Old Testament Passover and the New Testament Easter, this scripture is correctly translated Passover by the King James Version translators as it alludes to the Jewish custom of carefully putting away from their houses all leaven upon the approach of the feast of Passover, thus making the word Passover more appropriate than Easter or Easter lamb in the context. A paraphrase would be Christ our fulfillment of the Old Testament Pascha is sacrificed for us. Tyndale was correct to translate Easter lamb and not Passover because the terms were not clearly defined until 1611. With this in mind, let's look at what Hislop claimed about the King James Version in his book The Two Babylons. Everyone knows that the name Easter used in our translation of Acts chapter 12 verse 4 refers not to any Christian festival, but to the Jewish Passover. This is one of the few places in our version where the translators show undue bias. Linguists and true Assyriologists would laugh at the claims made by Hislop's pseudo-scholarship. Since it does not hold up under basic scrutiny, its claims about Easter must be abandoned. Firstly, while Hislop boldly claimed Easter was pagan, he offered no real proof. Alexander Hislop also stated, Then look at Easter. What means the term Easter itself? It is not a Christian name. It bears its Chaldean origin on its very forehead. Easter is nothing else than Astarte, one of the titles of Beltas, the Queen of Heaven, whose name as pronounced by the people of Nineveh was evidently identical with that now in common use in this country. That name found by Layard on the Assyrian monuments is Ishtar. The worship of Bel and Astarte was very early introduced into Britain along with the Druids, the priests of the groves. Some have imagined that the Druidical worship was first introduced by the Phoenicians, who centuries before the Christian era traded to the tin mines of Cornwall. But the unequivocal traces of that worship are found in regions of the British Islands where the Phoenicians never penetrated and it has everywhere left indelible marks of the stronghold which it must have had on the early British mind. It must be noted that most cults, such as the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Seventh-day Adventists, gravitate warmly to Hislop's false ideas. While he does offer some sound information about pagan traditions becoming Roman Catholic practice, in his book he fails to recognise that biblical Christian traditions that were formed from the Word of God were initiated by Jehovah God himself and have no roots in paganism whatsoever. Hislop fails to see that the Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, first fruits, etc., were ordained by God who did not borrow ideas from Israel's pagan neighbours. Hislop's whole claim is based merely on phonetics and not on historical verification. His whole argument is based on the false notion that Easter sounds like Ishtar and he therefore concludes that they must be related. Any linguist knows that this type of conclusion is unreasonable. Then without a single shred of evidence, Hislop denounces the entire biblical Christian celebration of Easter as pagan because of this phonetic similarity. This is absurd. Even if he was right, which he wasn't, do we need to throw out the entire celebration of Easter because an English word has roots in the name of a pagan god? Is this enough ground to wipe Easter off our church calendars? What about every other language group that doesn't use the word Easter? Are they wrong also, or just German and English speaking people? Hislop claims that the word Easter is of British origin. He then goes on to theorise that the word somehow became tied to the Hebrew word Ashtaroth, which then somehow became attached to the Greek Estate, and which is the same as the Babylonian Ishtar. Hislop performed all these linguistic gymnastics without understanding at all the Germanic roots of Easter, thus proving his ignorance on the matter. While Hislop has absolutely no evidence to support his theory, there is a library of evidence against his theory, the main one being that Hislop fails to recognise the relationship between the English word Easter and the German word Uster.
The fact that this essential piece of information is not mentioned even once in Hislop's book proves without a shadow of a doubt that he did not understand the basic etymology of Easter. This demonstration of the easter Uster bond again reinforces the Saxon and Germanic etymology in preference to some type of Babylonian goddess. This is plain for all to see and elementary to skilled linguists. Hislop stated, but the unequivocal traces of that worship are found in regions of the British islands where the Phoenicians never penetrated and it has everywhere left indelible marks of the stronghold which it must have had on the early British mind. This statement demonstrates that Hislop was surprised that the word Easter is used so frequently in England, concluding that the influence of the Phoenicians must have been greater than previously thought, thus demonstrating again that he knew nothing of the link to the German Uster, which all evidence leads to. C.F. Cruz in 1850 pointed out three years before Hislop wrote the two Babylons that our word Easter is of Saxon origin and of precisely the same import with its German cognate Ustern. The latter is derived from the old Teutonic form of Uferstehen, Uferstehan, that is resurrection. The etymology of Easter is easily traced to the German word for resurrection, not to some fabricated pagan goddess for which there is not a crumb of evidence. A child could understand how Easter came from Uster, but textual critics grapple to decipher Hislop's confusion because, like evolution, it is an inexhaustible myth that is a wild goose chase. You can spend forever going through the names of Ishtar in Latin, Hebrew, Greek, etc., and you'll be none the wiser. According to scripture, Jehovah initiated both Passover. The Hebrews didn't need intermediary pagans. Moses states in the book of Exodus that God gave the feast of Passover to the Jews and that God gave the specific date upon which the Passover was to be celebrated, the 14th of Nisan, which was formerly called Abib before the Exodus. The Jews did not borrow the Passover feast or the Passover date from anyone, but got both the feast and the date of the feast directly from Jehovah God. The Easter celebration, which is the Christian fulfillment of the Jewish Passover, occurred on the very same date as the Jewish celebration, the 14th of Nisan. Christians did not need to copy the resurrection idea or the resurrection date from pagans. Christians celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ literally rose from the dead in fulfillment of the Passover on that day. Hislop speculates that the Christian celebration was not based upon the Jewish Passover, but that Christians somehow abandoned the fulfillment of the Jewish Passover and instead celebrated an unknown fertility festival. There is no evidence for this apart from what Hislop theorized. If you're a Bible believer, you believe the Bible. If you're superstitious, you believe Hislop. In stark contrast, Let's take a quick look at the scholarship of some of the King James Version translators. Lancelot Andrews, one of the chief translators of the Authorised Version, spoke 15 European languages, which were at the time the majority of the modern languages of Europe. He had private devotions all written in Greek. He is still regarded as one of the greatest scholars ever. William Bearwell was an eminent Oriental scholar whose fame for Arabic learning was so great that scholars sought him out for assistance. He was the first person who considerably promoted and revived the study of the Arabic language and literature in Europe. In 1612 he published in Quattro an edition of the Epistles of St John in Arabic with a Latin version. He compiled an Arabic lexicon, which is like a dictionary, in three volumes and also began a Persian dictionary. He was educated in cognate languages and thoroughly conversant in the science of Semitic linguistics. That is, he knew a great deal about Hebrew sister languages, Arabic, Persian, Syriac, Aramaic, Coptic, etc. Miles Smith deeply studied the hundred church fathers from 100 to 300 AD and 200 more who wrote from 300 to 600 AD in Greek and Latin and made his own comments on each of them.
He was well acquainted with the marginal comments in the Hebrew language. He was fluent in Hebrew, also an expert in Chaldee, Syriac and Arabic, so that they were almost as familiar to him as his native tongue. Henry Seville was famous for his Greek and mathematical learning at a young age. He was Queen Elizabeth's tutor in Greek and mathematics. He translated countless ancient works from Latin and Greek. His chief work being the first to edit the complete works of Chrysostom, the most famous of the Greek church fathers, in eight large folios. A folio was the size of a large dictionary or encyclopedia. John Boyce had read the entire Bible by the age of five in Hebrew. By the age of six, he wrote Hebrew in a reasonable and stylish character. He was also just as skilled in Greek by his mid-teens. He was known to study continuously from 4 a.m. to 8 p.m., that is 16 hours straight. He had a library which contained one of the most complete and costly collections of Greek literature that had ever been collated. He left over 30,000 pages of writing when he died. He could read the Greek New Testament like he read English. This is a small portion of the testimonies of the 57 translators who translated the King James Version. How sad that in this day and age, we trust someone like Hislop, who was uneducated in the basics of linguistics and barely knew any English etymology at all, let alone any ancient Semitic languages fluently. Many Bible critics and translators today who perhaps know how to use the Strongs or Vines or took a year or two of Greek or Hebrew at some Bible school have followed in Hislop's footsteps. What a shame that believers devote so much time arguing against Easter, something that Christ himself initiated, or waste so much time attacking the King James Bible. It also seems strange, if not blasphemous, that we as Bible-believing Christians could think that the King James Version translators would insert the name of a pagan deity in place of the word Pascha. Imagine if we placed Krishna or Allah in its stead. To think that the world's most famous translation could get it so wrong here is sheer ignorance on our behalf. To believe that Tyndale, Kramer, Martin Luther, Coverdale, Matthews, the translators of the Great Bible and of the Bishop's Bible and of the King James Bible were referring to a pagan god of the spring called Ishtar is so absurd that it becomes humorous when examined. If this hearsay is true, then Luther and Tyndale who named Christ the Easter Lamb were being blasphemous as it would be like calling Christ the fertility goddess lamb. Imagine calling Christ the Allah lamb or the Buddha lamb. But I suppose this is why people have rejected Easter, for conscience sake. But with the information provided, it is time for Christians to examine Easter in a logical way and not follow conspiracy theories, which is usually the practice of cults. This type of modern biblical criticism more than anything else has weakened and almost destroyed the high view of the Bible previously held in Christendom. The early church never debated whether or not to celebrate Easter, but only debated on which day to celebrate it on. Most claims that Easter in Acts chapter 12 verse 4 was a mistake or a mistranslation in the King James Bible stem from the pagan origins myth. However, there is also another reason why some reject Easter being inserted here. The phrase, everyone knows that Pascha means Passover, not Easter, is often claimed with pulpit-thumping assertion in many anti-Easter articles on the internet. Yet modern Greek dictionaries define Pascha as Easter. If you ask any modern Greek what Pascha means, every one of them will tell you that Pascha means Easter. The very opposite to what some Greek experts within the assembly of textual critics will assert. Many of God's people repeat what these experts affirm, as I myself once did, either claiming Easter to be pagan or citing the inaccuracy of Acts chapter 12 verse 4. Now about that time Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. He killed James the brother of John with the sword, and because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. 
Acts chapter 12 verse 4 in the King James Version. With our Western way of thinking, we sometimes separate Pascha into two distinct time periods, one being the Passover and the other Easter. It helps to know that in New Testament times, Jews were celebrating the Passover and Christians were celebrating the resurrection, Easter, at the same period of time. It would appear that the rationale of the King James Version translators in using the word Easter and not Passover was that Herod would have thought in terms of the Jewish designation and was waiting until after the festival to bring Peter before the Jews, as his desire was to please the Jews. While Luke the writer of Acts made it perfectly clear by stating them were the days of unleavened bread that he was speaking of the Christians Pascha and was making mention that the Passover feast day had already taken place and the feast of unleavened bread was taking place. Luke forced the semantic domain of Pascha by making this statement and wasn't referring to the Passover feast day which was on the first day of the feast but stated that Peter was taken during the days of unleavened bread which was a seven day period after the feast. Even the liberal translator and scholar Philip Schaff said, Easter is the resurrection festival which follows the Passover proper but is included in the same festive week. Luke didn't have separate words in Greek to specify the difference between the Passover proper and the resurrection celebration, Easter. He used Pascha and added, then were the days of unleavened bread, emphasizing the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He followed this pattern throughout the book of Acts. Luke would not have added it for some trivial reason. Rather, he was inserting information that would place the Greek Pascha into context in Greek literature and the Textus Receptus itself. The use of the word Pascha in early Christian writings dealt with the celebration of Easter and not just the Jewish Passover. Luke rarely went out of his way to explain the Old Testament practices of the Jews in Acts. For example, in chapters 1 and 2 and right through Acts, things like a Sabbath day's journey from Jerusalem, the day of Pentecost was come, were written without any explanation whatsoever. So the addition of the words, then were the days of unleavened bread, indicate that there was something that Luke wanted the readers to know about the particular chronology of the occurrence of the 12th chapter of Acts. Had Luke not included these words, there would be no doubt as to it meaning the Jewish feast and the thought of a Christian feast would only come to mind in the knowledge that historically the early church did celebrate Easter more or less in the same festive week. Also, it would not have been necessary to make any distinction at all as the King James Version translators did. But the fact remains that Luke did mention it, and the very learned King James translators did see this insertion vital to explain the context correctly. The King James Version translators were well aware that Tyndale changed many of the references from Easter to Passover in his editions of the New Testament after he invented the word Passover, and also how Pascha was used for both Easter and Passover in early church literature. Yet they were also especially familiar with the disputations about Easter in the first few centuries of Christianity. Dr. G. W. H. Lamp has correctly stated, Pascha came to mean Easter in the early church. Dr. Lamp lists several rules and observances by Christians in celebration of their Pascha or Easter. He also points to various Greek words such as Pascazo or Pascalua that came to mean celebrate Easter and Eastertide. Likewise, Dr. Gerald Kittle notes, Pascha came to be called Easter in the celebration of the resurrection within the primitive church. It must be remembered that Pascha was the most important feast of the Jews. The early church, including Luke, would have initiated the trend of not celebrating the old shadow Pascha, but celebrating the new Pascha. Alfred Erdeshim, a Messianic Jew of the 19th century, said of the Last Supper, it was to be the last of the old Paschas, the first or rather symbol of promise of the new. He clearly knew that every Pascha from the time of the cross was to be the new Pascha and not the old. John Owen wrote, There was also a signal vindication of the truth pleaded for in an instance of fact among the primitive churches. 
there was an opinion which prevailed very early among them about the necessary observation of Easter in the room of the Jewish Passover for the solemn commemoration of the death and resurrection of our Saviour. And it was taken for granted by most of them that the observance hereof was countenanced, if not rendered necessary to them, by the example of the apostles, for they generally believed that by them it was observed, and that it was their duty to accommodate themselves to their practice. By the later second century, it was accepted that the celebration of Easter was a practice of the disciples and an undisputed tradition, that Easter was to be observed by virtue of apostolical tradition, was generally granted by all. Again, Philip Schaff observed, From some hints in the apostles viewed in the light of the universal and uncontradicted practice of the church in the second century, it may be inferred that the annual celebration of the death and resurrection of Christ and of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit originated in the apostolic age. In truth, Christ crucified, risen, living in the church was the one absorbing thought of the early Christians. As this thought expressed itself in the weekly observance of Sunday, so it would also very naturally transform the two great typical feasts of the Old Testament into the Christian Easter and Whit Sunday. The Paschal controversies of the second century related not to the fact, but to the time of the Easter festival, and Polycarp of Smyrna, an ancient of Rome, traced their traditions to a difference in the practice of the apostles themselves. Schaff indicates that historically there was never any debate within the early church over a pagan Easter, or whether or not it should be celebrated, but primarily what day it should be celebrated on. In Bible times, the 14th of Nisan could fall on any day of the week, but some in the church felt that the 17th, also known as the Feast of Firstfruits, the date Jesus rose from the dead, should be the proper day that Easter be celebrated and the Lord's Supper taken. But that could also fall on any day of the week. Finally, it was concluded that the Sunday following the 14th should be the day. This practice was followed by most churches except for the Quarto Decimans, derived from the Vulgate Latin, Quarta Decimal, meaning 14, who kept Easter on the Passover day, the 14th. Because they strictly followed the law, they were generally considered legalists by most of the church fathers. Around 120 AD, Polycarp, who was a disciple of John, went to see the Christian leader Anicetus to discuss the proper date for this celebration. Polycarp, Bishop of Smyrna, visited Rome to confer with him about the controversy over the date of Easter. Those in Asia celebrated it on the movable weekday of the 14th of Nisan, which was the Old Testament Jewish Passover date, while those in Rome did it on the first Sunday after Passover. They decided to let each group continue as they had been doing, rather than call it a split. We read in Eusebius, a question of no small importance arose at that time, that is, about AD 190. The diocese of all Asia, as from an older tradition, held that the 14th day of the moon, on which day the Jews were commanded to sacrifice a lamb, should always be observed as the feast of the life-giving Pasch, contending that the fast ought to end on that day whatever a day of the week it might happen to be. However, it was not the custom of the churches in the rest of the world to end it at this point, as they observed the practice, which from apostolic tradition had prevailed to the present time, of terminating the fast on no other day than of that of the resurrection of our Saviour. These words of the father of church history tell us almost all we need to know concerning the Paschal controversy in its first stage. A letter of Irenaeus is among the extracts just referred to, and this shows that the diversity of practice regarding Easter had existed at least from the time of 120 AD. Further, Irenaeus states that Polycarp, who like the other Asiatics, kept Easter on the 14th day of the moon, whatever day of the week that might be, following therein the tradition which he claimed to have derived from St. John the Apostle, came to Rome around 150 AD about this very question. Paul had prophetically given good advice to the Roman church on these matters. One man esteems one day above another, another esteems every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regards the day regards it to the Lord, and he that does not regard the day to the Lord he does not regard it. But why do you judge your brother, or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Interestingly, Paul scolded the Galatian church in Asia for lapsing into ritualism, saying, 
But now after you have known God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you again desire to be in bondage? You observe days, months, seasons, and years. I am afraid for you, lest I have labored for you in vain. Galatians chapter 4 verses 9 to 11. Corto decimans were looked upon by the early church much the same as Seventh-day Adventists are seen today, trying to impose concepts from the dispensation of the law into the dispensation of grace. Unfortunately, many Corto decimans were persecuted and killed for this belief. Corto decimanism was almost thoroughly snuffed out by the Ecumenical Council of Nicaea. When the question arose concerning the most holy day of Easter, it was decreed by common consent to be expedient that this festival should be celebrated on the same day by all in every place. It seemed to everyone a most unworthy thing that we should follow the custom of the Jews, who in their celebration of this most holy solemnity, who polluted wretches having stained their hands with a nefarious crime, are justly blinded in their minds. It is fit, therefore, that rejecting the practice of this people, we should perpetuate to all future ages the celebration of this rite in a more legitimate order, which we have kept from the first day of our Lord's Passion, even to the present times. Let us then have nothing in common with the most hostile rabble of the Jews. Although sometimes seemingly anti-Semitic, and although sometimes incorrect, the Council of Nicaea's final decision on Easter was in accord with the majority of the early church fathers, which was what really matters. Once the churches became unified about Easter in the 4th century, the date was more consistent until the West's adoption of the revised Gregorian calendar in the 16th century. Although Britain didn't accept the calendar until 1752, most of Europe had accepted a different calendar during the generation of the King James Version translators. This observance and its basic structure survives with us to this time, with Easter Sunday being Resurrection Sunday, representing the 17th of Nisan, and Good Friday being the date, which is a representation of the 14th of Nisan, although in 32 AD, the day that Jesus died, it was a Thursday. These calendar modifications in Europe would have also caused many of the world's finest mathematicians, theologians and scholars to be examining these trends, including the King James Version translators. King James Bible translator Henry Seville was an expert in the Greek language, mathematics and church history and had been personal tutor in Greek and mathematics to Queen Elizabeth. He also founded the first chairs of geometry and astronomy in Oxford. His greatest work besides his work on the King James Bible, was translating the complete works of the most famous Greek church father, John Chrysostom, from Greek into English. During his compilation of 15,800 manuscript sheets, he scoured all the great libraries of Europe, buying the oldest and purest of the Chrysostom manuscripts. Seville's edition of Chrysostom has been called the one great work of Renaissance scholarship carried out in England and was the most considerable work of pure learning undertaken in England at that time. Seville, who frequented Europe, was considered by some as the greatest scholar of his age. Adam Nicholson, who wrote a book about the translators, dispelled the myth that the King James Bible emerged from an isolated and insular England by saying, A river of European influences run through it, and no more open conduit than Henry Seville. Seville translated Acts chapter 12 verse 4 as a member of the Oxford Translation Committee assigned to translate Acts, the Gospels and Revelation. Seville was often called in by King James to translate church books into Latin, Italian or French. Chrysostom, whose works Seville translated from Greek into English, was staunchly opposed to quartodeciminism, which occurred mainly in Asia. While Arrhenius claimed it had roots in apostolic tradition via John, the majority of the church practiced Easter on the Sunday after the Passover feast. In his 1612 edition of Homilies 27 volume 6, Seville gives the title Chrysostom's Discourse Against Those Who Were Judaizing and Observing Their Fasts, revealing Seville's depth of knowledge of the Easter controversies. Interestingly, the earliest book with mathematical content to be printed at Oxford was printed by Charles Kyforth in 1520, 
This book explained how to make calculations for the date of Easter. The second mathematical book to be published in Oxford was Sir Henry Seville's lectures on Euclid's Elements, printed in 1621. If one were to search the biographies of Christian history and select a person equipped to translate Acts chapter 12 verse 4, it would be hard to discover anyone more able than Seville. Obsessed with Chrysostom, an enemy of Quartodeciminism, Seville was intimately acquainted with the Easter controversies. He was a noted mathematician with a mind for detail and chronological events, and one of the greatest English scholars who personally tutored the Queen of England. I doubt you would find anyone more appropriate than Seville. Bancroft, one of the translators, penned the rules to be observed in translation. He lists some of the interesting procedures that demolish myths about the private interpretation or translator's oversight in regard to Easter. Rule 8 states, Every particular man of each company to take you some chapter or chapters and having translated or amended them severally by himself where he thinks good, all to meet together, confer what they have done and agree for their parts what shall stand. Thus the translators of Acts, for example, all personally translated the book by themselves and then their particular group corporately amalgamated those personal translations into one copy which was wholeheartedly agreed to by the entire group. Rule 9 requires, As one company hath dispatched any one book in this manner, they shall send it to the rest to be considered of seriously and judiciously, for his majesty is very careful on this point. Once the group had reached their consensus, they then sent their manuscript of Acts off to the rest of the translators to be examined by each group separately. Rule 10 records, if any company upon you review of your book so sent really doubt or differ upon any place so send them word thereof note the place and withal send their reasons to which if they consent not the difference to be compounded at the general meeting which is to be of the chief persons of each company at the end of your work hence henry seville in addition there was a chance to respond to the reviewers in front of a committee rule 11 when any place of special obscurity is doubted of, letters to be directed by authority to send to any learned man of the land for his judgment of such a place. So if agreement could not be reached, further authorities in the land were to be consulted on particular matters. This reveals that great lengths went into the translation's accuracy. Many people think that Easter only appears in Acts chapter 12 verse 4 in the King James Version of the Bible. There is also confirmation for the fact that the King James Version translators defined Easter as the resurrection of our Lord. In the frequent mention of the various tables in the preface of the King James Version itself, which show to us that to the translators, Easter was the holiest day of the year, and they knew exactly what it was, the resurrection day. In the preface, which is in the front of the original 1611 Bible, Easter is referred to an almanac of 49 years and a date provided for each of those years. This indicates that Easter, in this case, refers to the Easter celebration by Christians for Christ's resurrection and not to the Jewish Passover. Also, the following page, which is a table to find Easter forever, refers to the Christian Easter. In addition, the table proper lessons to be read for the first lessons, both at morning and evening prayer, refers to the Christian Easter and also includes other days as Whit Sunday and Trinity Sunday, which are holy days determined by the date of Christian Easter. This is also true in the table Proper Psalms on Certain Days, and on the following page, events before and after Easter are described. Thus, when Easter was referred to in the preface of the 1611 Bible, it was referring to what we know today to be Easter. It never refers to Easter as the Passover, and when Passover is referred to, it is the Jewish holiday. From the above, one must conclude that when Easter was inserted by the King James Version translators, it was done so by design, showing their trend of using Easter as a post-resurrection Pascha and Passover as a pre-resurrection Pascha, also causing the definition of Easter as a Jewish Passover to become obsolete. As the Oxford Dictionary would later define Easter in the multi-volume Oxford English Dictionary, also showing a second meaning. 2. The Jewish Passover, obsolete.
thus agreeing with Seville, who was an Oxford man himself. The King James translation ended an 86-year trend that began with Tyndale. Scott Jones, an expert on Easter, said, It doesn't take a saving to figure it out. The death of Jesus Christ, Christ our Passover, 1 Corinthians 5.7, occurred before the days of unleavened bread. The resurrection of Jesus Christ occurred during the days of unleavened bread. And Luke went out of his way to explain to his readers, then were the days of unleavened bread. As we enter into an Easter season, let us keep Easter not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth, 1 Corinthians 5.8. That is, Easter without legalism, without pagan myths, without conspiracy theories, and without degrading the authorised version. It would be much more edifying for the church to learn of subjects such as the Passover lamb fulfilled in Christ, or the fulfilment of the 69 weeks of Daniel prophecy on the 10th of Nisan, which is Palm Sunday, uh, the Lord's Supper, the blood, the resurrection, etc., which no doubt many have been doing, however, should now do with even more boldness, proclaiming them without unnecessary doubting or confusion. History reveals that the majority of Christians worldwide have celebrated Easter because Jesus, not pagans, said, Do this in remembrance of me. Luke chapter 22 verse 19 with 1 Corinthians 11.24 Paul stated, Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 31